This is episode number 86 of Hebrews in Exile with our honorable teacher, Robert B. Holman Jr. and Sean Appleton. And most of the times when we're speaking in this podcast, we're directing our attention to those individuals that are a part of organized religion. But what about those individuals that are not a part of organized religion, but have a moral compass that is totally in line with the teachings of the Most High? Well, we're going to talk about that in this particular episode of Hebrews in Exile. So, Hebrews in Exile, you know what we do. Let's Go! You're of the harvest. You're of my life. You're of creation. You make everything right. Well, 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 well. This is Rabbi Robert B. Holman Jr. and Sean Appleton. And this is Hebrews in Exile. Exile. I said that like I was a WWE wrestler. And Sean <laughs> Appleton, woo! What's on your mind? <laughs> What's on my mind? What's on your mind? Oh, wow, that's a great question. I have been enamored about um, a couple of different things, but what's uh, been at the forefront of my mind is relationships and how the Most High has literally um, opened my eyes up to see um, we talked about it not too long ago, I think off, maybe off camera and off, offline about, um, doing, cause I'm doing a, you know, the series on shelf team and kind of the roller coaster book that you call it. I call it the, you know, the, uh, uh, the book where, uh, the children of, oh boy, come on, stop me, stop me, stop me. I said the children, that's not true. The empire of Israel. Like I said, it's about per, uh, progress, not perfection. Um, they have their ups and downs with the most high. They get hot and then they get cold. But then I was thinking as I'm coming out of this series, what am I going to uh, tackle next? And one of the things that's very poignant in the forefront that I keep hearing in the minds and the hearts of people is dealing with relationships and how the most high deals with relationships. And we talked about it and I said, you know, that's going to be an extensive teaching. But I thought about the simplicity of it. And I said, who's the greatest teacher and mentor when it comes to understanding a relationship between a man and a woman? Most high. The most high. I said, I need to go no further than to look at how the most high treats his wife, how he adores her, how he treats her as a treasure. He places the world at her feet. He chased her because of his love for his wife. Yep. And at the same time, I said to myself, there are also requirements that the wife has. The most high requires that he be the head of that relationship, that the most high requires that there is. Now, people are not going to agree with this word, but I don't care. The most high requires obedience that there is a standard that is maintained and that when our ancestors were brought out of the land of Mitzrayim and they were brought to Mount Horev, he gave them the requirements upon which this relationship was going to operate. We call it the 10 utterances. And they said, all that you said, we will do. And so I'm looking at that dynamic and I'm saying to myself, you know, if I'm, as I'm looking at relationships and whatnot, um, If the Most High ever manifested himself in the flesh, which we know the Most High is not a man, and I'm asking you this question. If the Most High came down right now and was in a relationship with a woman, would you call the Most High toxic masculinity? What? Would that be toxic masculinity? No. No. See, the Most High has a way of operating. But see, if we took that that mold and said, I'm going to mold my relationship with my girlfriend or with my wife, the same way the most high molds his relationship with the, with the empire of Israel. Would you call that toxic masculinity? No, that's how it's supposed to function. Well, let's, let's, let's let's, unpack that a little bit. Yeah. Let's talk about one word that you used in there that you said, okay. You know, people might not agree with. Mm Mm-hmm. And that's that word obedience. Obedience. 
a melanated woman has a distinct problem yeah. with yeah. obeying her melanated man mm-hmm. until he demonstrates that she can trust him. That's true. That's true. Because you see, trust is the central is the central uh, peg in any relationship. Oh, absolutely. So if I can trust you, then I can follow you. Right. If I can trust you, right. then let's not use the word obey in the context of how we in this westernized world talk about obey. Yeah, because it's too close to... Because if we do that, if we do that, yeah, then, you know, men rise up and talk about, you're supposed to obey me. Well, you know, I can't obey you if I can't trust you. Yeah, and here, let me say this, because I need to clean something up, because I don't want to turn this into, like you said, this issue of sticking my chest out trying to say, okay, you must obey me. And then, then it really does turn into this issue of being toxic. This is not about the female. Anything that I just said just a second ago has nothing to do with the female. It has everything to do with the male. Meaning, the reason why a lot of our melanated women cannot find what they're looking for is because the male does not operate in the office of showing that he's trustworthy and has integrity. If you look at the example that I said, if I look at the Most High, what did the Most High do? The Most High showed his bride that he was the great protector, that he could provide. And you start out every single diatribe that way when we talk about the Most High. I was the one that took you out of the land of Mitzrayim, and I delivered you from your oppressor. When you were this and when you were that, I showed you. We do not show as individuals to our women that we are worthy of the office and title of being headship because we do not show it. So therefore, how in the world is she going to be able to follow or be in league with someone who's claiming to be have headship and leadership and show integrity if we don't exude it first? Well, that that all that comes back to my to my to my statement. Right. All of what you said is systemic to trust. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. See, um, I can love you. And. My loving you has got nothing to do with my ability to trust you. Right. Agreed. I love you, but I don't trust you. Right. I don't trust you to um, to provide for me. Mm-hmm. I don't trust you to be my protector. Mm-hmm. I don't trust you to be there for me because the other aspect of the melanated man is he has wandering eyes. Ah, oh, yeah. That he does. And so this relationship thing that we're trying to, that, we, that you brought up in, in our opening tonight really is systemic to having, and, and you know, and then people say these, I hear him say these words, I want to find me a God-fearing man. Well, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah. He goes to church? <laughs> right. And yeah. that's and that's messed up, yeah. Because you got you have more examples of infidelity in the church as you have as much of an example of infidelity in the church as you have out of the church. That's right. That's right. Right. And that's 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 so that's, that's our problem. Yeah, that and that's we, the problem. So when we talk about relationship, and we talk about relationship from a from a Hebraic perspective, the Most High has given us mitzvot in Mm -hmm. terms of how that relationship is supposed to function and how that relationship is supposed to work. Yeah, the the scope of this particular topic and issue is so so massive because, like you said, there's mitzvot on how the relationship is supposed to work. And I, I was often wondering, 
because we got, you know, as, as I, and most people don't notice, I'm going to give you a little bit of backstory about uh, myself. Obviously I'm married to my lovely wife of 18 years. You were the one that married us. Um, uh, back when dinosaurs roamed the earth, <laughs> but we got on, we, we, we got married under the auspices of Christianity. Yes. And my whole entire outlook has changed because I'm studying the mitzvot. I understand what, who my, who my, what my patriarchs have of how they've governed themselves as men of integrity and following after the most high and patterning themselves after the relationship that the most high has with the empire of Israel. And it's totally completely changed on how I look at particular things and understanding what marriage actually is um, in terms of from a civil standpoint versus what it means from a re- uh, having a relationship with the most high and having him be the governance over that and understanding what those dynamics are, understanding my role, understanding what her role is, um, and walking in that. And it's such a, a, a robust topic that I often wonder how in the world we were able to make it so long under those auspices of Christianity as that was having, had presiding over my relationship and being able to matriculate to where I am now. I'm just thankful that the most high was able to be patient enough to preside within our, my relationship with my wife to let me see certain things as the leader of the household. Because again, that comes with a lot of responsibility that I don't take lightly. If I look at how the most high operates, he places the world at his woman's feet. And I endeavor to do the same thing as well. But at the same time, I understand that I have a responsibility as a protector in things that require me to operate in that office. And that's not really wasn't explained in that because the, the, one of the, the failing points of Christianity is its lack of specificity on things. They leave a lot of things up for interpretation. So depending on how the wind is blowing in culture nowadays is the way Christianity will blow. So that's why we're not seeing, I think, a lot of longevity when it comes to relationships as well, because the definitive aspects that we get from being Hebraic yeah. are absent from that culture. Absolutely. Well, I look forward to uh, <laughs> to that to that study. Yeah, it's going to be from a Hebraic perspective. Be I, um, yeah, what's on your mind? Well, where are you, you at? Know, I've been doing a lot of thinking. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, I, I, I ran across a situation where a young lady that I was talking to shared with me the idea that, you know, I wasn't brought up to go to church. Hmm. She says, so going to church is not something that I understand and I don't understand for the most part what they're talking about. Yeah. Does she does she elaborate on what that actually meant? What what does that mean to you going to church? What what Exactly. I mean, she says, Well I, I, I never was I wasn't brought up that way. So I don't I don't know what that means. And I and mm. I thought about that and I've been thinking about that all day. To understand that you and I, you and I, are hammering on people who go to church. That's right. That's right. And in our thought process, we want to throw all of our melanated brethren into that pot, and we can't do that. True. Okay. And that's All simple right. because there are people, there are people who are Hebrew and don't know they're Hebrew, can't know they're Hebrew because they're not in an environment where the idea of their ancestors being a part of the diaspora out of the land is part of the narrative that they can hear. You're not going to, it's not anything that's taught in school. Mm-hmm. It's not anything that's taught in black colleges. Mm-hmm. 
It's not anything that's taught anywhere. Mm-hmm. And I would, I would, I would venture to say to you that I don't know, Sean. We are probably part of a minority group of people that you can probably maybe count on one hand that even talk about the things that we talk about concerning the melanated man, his relationship to this opulent nation that's called Hebrew Israel. Yeah. Yeah. I I would agree with you on that one. Yeah. We're a small minority. And as I thought about it, I thought about the bully, the bully in the, in the pack. Hmm. Okay. And the bully in the pack is the narrative that Christianity puts on people that says, if you don't believe like me, you're going to hell. Right. Right. They shame you or make you give you some trepidation. Yeah. And 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 infuse that. Yeah. Yeah. Introduce that. Yeah. And I'm going, no. 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 Mm-hmm. Right. Now our text and being Hebraic calls by the instructions and the commandments of the Most High that we assemble as a people. But everybody does not have the ability to do that because they are on an island by themselves. Right. So uh, in regards, yeah. 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 And see, and we're talking, we're talking to a lot of people who are on an Island by themselves. I see. I see. And, And I don't know. I don't know if they're listening to us, gaining the information that we're, that we're, that we have and still, and still, associating with the idolatry of Christian church because they don't have a congregation to congregate with. So they're on an island by themselves. And do you think part of that, you know, a lot of them have have defected and said, you know, I'm I'm through with this organized way of, of, of doing stuff. And I don't, is there a lot of trepidation? Do you think because they just don't want to be a part of the mess That they've been, yes. and then, okay, okay. Yes. So I begin to think about this, and I'm going, mm. well, I'm listening to, not I'm listening, I've studied the book of Daniel, and I've heard the Most High speak through Daniel when Daniel says, <clears throat> I looked and I saw one that was sitting on his throne. I saw the Ancient of Days. Hmm. And he describes the Ancient of Days, and he talks about the books being opened. When well, I've talked about this before, but oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it, it, has, it has a greater impact on me now. Hmm. He talks about the the ancient of days and the books being open, the book of the wicked and the book of the righteous. Well, I know that there are four classifications of individuals that fit into wicked and righteous. Okay. Let's talk about the wicked first. All right. The good, the bad, and the ugly. In the mind of the Most High, there are two classifications of wicked people. There are those who are wicked to the extent that they have no respect towards what he has created, and that is humankind. Mm. They treat what he has created in humankind as if they... They were just something that you could go out and just like an animal. You, let's let's go hunting for human kind. Let's go shoot them. Okay. Let's treat them like whatever. Okay. That's wicked. Mm-hmm.
racism is wicked. Oh, without a shadow of a doubt. Absolutely. People who are racist to the bone, mm -hmm. I don't care if you're black or white, mm -hmm. you fall into a category that is defined wicked because your motives are directed at harm to a human being that the Most High has created. Mm -hmm. And he is the only one who can be the judge of life and death. Right. The second category of wicked is germane to those individuals such as the nation of Israel who he taught his mitzvot, who he gave his mitzvot rules and regulations to, to whom have turned away from them and began serving other powers and left his left his instructions by the way. Right. And have no intent mm -hmm. of turning back to them. Yeah, that's wicked. Yeah, I agree with you on that. Now, one. now <laughs> when you studied when you when you're doing the book of Shaftim, there's language in there that says, and Israel did that which was evil. In the in the perspective, yep, in the perspective and sight high. of Most High, absolutely. What did they do? They turned away from his mitzvot, mm -hmm. and they began once again following other Elohim's. Now, let me interject something in here real quick. That was an observation that I made when we're, we're doing Shoftim, and I think I might have made mention to this, and I say that a lot. But if we look at our ancestors and you look at the Book of Shoftim, what happens? They get a judge, they get a rescuer. They get back into right standing with the Most High by crying out, which we also know that's action. That means that they followed uh, the mitzvot, and then they cried out to the Most High. The Most High answered, and they got back into right standing well, with now, the let's, Most let's, High. Let's, 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 let's clarify that, okay? Okay. Their crying out was a demonstration Correct. of their turning back to the mitzvot, which, which, which put the Most High in a place that he had to honor right. what they right. were doing. Right. It's an action action. It's an action. Correct. They demonstrated turning back to the midfold, which, which is how we're going to get redeemed. Right. So at least in the, in regards to that, our ancestors, they fell out of league with the most high, the most high put his foot on their neck, mashed on them, knew what was going on and decided to cry out and turn back to the Most High. Yeah. Look at the state that we're in right now. Oh, yeah. The Most High has kicked us out of the land, took yeah. his belt off, gave us a nice stern whooping, and we don't have the ability to know to turn back to the Most High. What do we do? As soon as we got a foot put on our neck, we turn to other gods. That's a state even to even just to understand that, to say even in that state, the Most High is has blessed us because it is a blessing with grace to not can be completely wiped out because we still have to have a remnant. But I looked at and when I'm doing show team, I said, man, at least they had enough uh, sense that when they were getting oppressed, they turned back to the most high. We're over here getting oppressed and we turning back to other gods. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Huh? Whoa. Whoa. Whoa there. <laughs> hold on. Hold on, grasshopper. Hold on. Hold on. There's a difference between our ancestors and, and those of us that are in exile. Mm. We have to go back to text. Okay. In text, don't remember where, but it said, and there arose up a generation who knew not Yah. Mm -hmm. Didn't know him. They didn't know him. We, in this exile, are part of generations, which is different than when we read in Shaftim, because in Shaftim, they had a knowledge of the Most High, and they had knowledge of the history that if we're oppressed, we can, if we're oppressed, and we, with heartfelt contrition, Mm -hmm. cry out to him, he will send us 
a deliverer. Mm -hmm. In this exile, we don't have that, that thread. The melanated man in this exile doesn't, the most high has already told us in the prophets, uh, they don't know me. So getting our literal behinds whooped and going through all of the devastation that we are going through doesn't lead us back to him because we don't have a history of doing it mm -hmm. since we've been in this exile. But that's why we have prophets. We have individuals that are there, that are part of the remnant, that are there to lead individuals back to the Most High. He's but not we have a problem. <laughs> but we have a problem. Okay. And the problem is, is that the people don't recognize the prophet when he's speaking to them. No, yeah, he is just, too, yeah. He's just another man. Mm. And how dare you? Mm. Refer to yourself as a prophet. Right, right. I mean, we, <laughs> we got prophets, so-called. Mm -hmm. But the question on my mind is, I'm looking at text, and I'm looking at the men that the Most High called to speak for him. They oh. were on his team. That's right. They walked, they walked in his rules and his instructions. Mm-hmm. They listened to him, and they only spoke when he told them to speak. And when he told them to speak, the information that they were to provide, go tell Israel their past. That's right. Tell them where they came from. Mm -hmm. Tell them who brought them out. Mm -hmm. Tell them what they're doing now. Tell them why I'm angry. Tell them what I'm going to do to him in the state of my anger. And then go tell them what I'm going to do in the future, that even though I'm angry, I will not be angry with them forever. I will redeem them. Mm -hmm. Go tell them. So there's stages of, of what a prophet speaks. So today, when we look at, the, at this idea of being a prophet, somebody stuck on the and says, yeah, 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 I say, well, you all shut <laughs> up. <laughs> right. What the heck have you got to say? Exactly. Are you are you following the laws, the rules, and the statutes of the Most High? Are you honoring the primary thing that's a death penalty if we were in the land? Are you keeping the Sabbath? No. no are no. you worship? Are you worshiping a, a, a power that's not Him? Are you worshiping a man instead of Him? Mm -hmm. Yes. So can you speak for Him? Excuse my French, but I got to do it yep. this way. Come on. Hell no. Man. And that's the con conundrum. So, 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 you know, this whole idea of, of, of where we are and what I'm talking about of people, you know, not, there's a lot of people who just don't. They, they don't know anything about church. Mm. But this is what they do now. And I'm learning this because I'm around it every day. Mm -hmm. I'm learning that people are following the narrative of Jesus Christ in this aspect. Okay. Disciples said, good master, teach us how to pray. <laughs> and what did he say? The first thing out of his mouth, pray our father. Which art in, in heaven. heaven. Now. Holy. Yeah. So set apart is your name. So understand that you can read all the way through that Greek narrative, and you're never going to hear J.C. tell you to pray to him. No, you, you, you won't. You won't. And, I, you know, well, I, we're going to come back to that in a second because yeah. you're in so, a good spot. So, so the narrative or the thing that's being expressed by good people mm -hmm. who have 
a respect for their creator, when they pray, they pray to the Father. Mm. And I hear this all the time. Mm -hmm. Oh, I pray to the Father. Yeah, I don't pray to this guy. When I wake up in the morning, I say, Father, thank you. When I go to bed at night, I say, Father, and my prayers are always directed to the Father. But see, you know, that, what do you think about this? I mean, I think that's a good spot for an individual to be in to say, you know what, um, um, not to pigeonhole everybody, because uh, we're, we're speaking systemically about uh, melanated folks, but those individuals that don't know anything about church, which is which is a great mentality to have because we've matriculated into the idea of saying that we don't, we're not church. We don't prescribe to being religious. No. I don't look at just because we have the same frequency of meeting on a specific day every single week at a specific time does not mean that that's analogous or systemic to what they do at the seven o'clock and nine o'clock and 11 o'clock service across the street. We, we, I look at it no different as if uh, you work for the state of California and the state of California, there's an executive director and he says, we will meet on Monday morning at eight o'clock every single week. And we are going to have a meeting and this is what we're going to talk about. Yeah. You don't look at that as being yeah. religious. Yeah. This, I mean, yeah. And, I mean, and just because we sing songs of worship, well, Israel sang songs of worship. Absolutely. After, after we conquered and the most yeah. high delivered, yeah. we have individuals that we have different songs that we're saying. Matter of fact, it's funny how the, the, the songs that I remember the most are by women. Yeah. And, and, and understand something. The history of Israel, the way they learned the mitzvot you sang them and yep. the instructions of the most high they were a song to them mm -hmm. they sang them yeah and, and and just so everybody understands what i'm i'm referring to when i say uh the women had songs because i'm referring to uh miriam yeah. as they come across the uh sea of suf and they yeah. get through yeah. and the most high delivers she's the one out there leading with the tambourine singing yeah. the song when uh deborah and Barak actually have their, uh, they, they conquer and they beat Sisera um, uh, in the book of Shoftim of Judges um, over the uh, kingdom of, uh, I think it's Yavin. Uh, they sang a song, and I think it's in chapter five. The whole entire chapter is nothing but a duet between the two that sings about their exploits and how they conquer. So it's adoration to the Most High as a form of remembering the things that the Most High has done. So, and it's not, and it's not, it's not, a, it's not an act for entertainment. Right. It, it's, it, it's to, it's to bring, it's to bring attention to. Right. It, the, the opulent deliverance that the Most High has wrought through his anointed people to deliver them out of oppression. Right. It's no different than every time when we like to watch a sporting event. Yeah, and yeah. they sing, you have some uh, artists, creative artists come in there and they do a rendition of the national anthem. It's bringing pride. It's bringing awareness of what has, and I'm, every country has theirs. We live in the United States because I know there's other people that listen to this podcast outside of the, the, the boundaries of the United States. But we sing a national anthem and that's what we're doing. It's adoration to the most high. So once you start putting things in the realm of religion, then they get that stigma. And that's what we're trying to change the hearts and minds of people. It's about statesmanship. It's about our constitution. It's about our ability to understand and gravitate and move in a, in a realm where we're thinking about nationalism in the form of being Hebraic instead of this rolling down the aisle, picking a bale of cotton uh, attitude that we have and invoking some type of Holy Ghost spirit in some poltergeist inside your your hubris in your mind to exemplify that you're holy somehow. That's not how that works. Exactly. And that's completely Greek. Exactly. <laughs> and it's completely Eurocentric. It, yep. Now, yeah. I explain the difference between the two ideas of being wicked. Wicked one wicked is one who just defies the aspect of humanity mm -hmm. and treats humanity like doggy doo doo. Yeah. Okay. 
Then the other one is those who have walked in Torah, understand Torah, but have turned away from Torah. He required, he calls those individuals wicked. wicked as so well. as okay. long as Hebrew Israel is in this state of idolatry, in his mind, he defines them as being wicked. Mm. Mm-hmm. And if they don't turn, they'll never see the light of day. Right. Agreed. Now, oh, <laughs> so now y'all <laughs> calling us wicked. Well, no, I'm not. I'm not calling you. Know, what's your scripture for that? Well, I'll tell you what you do. <laughs> okay. All right. I'll tell you what you do. Get this Why wisdom. don't you get your Bible out and see um, what he defines as wicked for yourself? Why don't you do that research and then then you'll know. Mm. I'm not going to do your homework for you. Right. You try to. Read I, the I know. Text and I know where it is. I know what it says. But I'm not. Well, why not? If you're going to say something, then give me the scripture for it. No. Do your own homework. Mm-hmm. I know it's there. Mm-hmm. And the most I knows it's there. Right. Have Google help you out. And if you spit on me, <laughs> touch not his anointing and do his prophets no, no harm. harm. Uh-oh. So see Uh-oh. how that's going to work for you. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Now. Let's get back to another to the to the to the second part of this. The other side, he says, I saw written in the books the names of the wicked and the names of the righteous. There are mm-hmm. two there are two criteria of righteous. Mm-hmm. And the need I, and the reason I need to bring this up is in light of the subject that I'm that we're talking about tonight about people who are not churched and don't have a clue. Mm-hmm. But there is text that says that the Torah of the Most High is nigh thee even in your heart and in your mouth to do it. Oh, yeah. You're a great prophet and so teacher. Consequently, Moshe said that. So consequently, the majority of Torah principles are part of your understanding and within your cranium already. Yeah, it's written there. So you don't have to be taught these. Mm -hmm. So now the first criteria of righteousness are individuals such as yourself and myself and the congregation that joins with us and those who have joined with Hebrew Israel and understanding that that the Most High spoke to Moshe in Numbers 15 and 15 and said, there shall be one Torah for you, Israel, and for the foreigner that resides with you. So there's one one set of rules, one set of laws, one set of instructions that govern everybody. Mm, mm -hmm, And mm -hmm. when you abide by those, and when we live our life by those, the Most High defines us in this exile as being righteous. All right. Because we're on we're on board with him. This we don't we don't have we don't have three or four powers, L's. Right. We only have one L, right? One power, mm-hmm. one mighty one. Mm-hmm. Okay, we don't have that, and we're walking out our life every day in this exile, in terms of those rules and those laws and those instructions that he's given us that apply to us in this exile. All of Torah applies, but we can't do it in this exile, which is the reason why he's given us grace. Yes. 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 So now that's 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 one side of righteousness. Mm-hmm. The other side of righteousness is germane to individuals who the most high defines are good people. Mm. There are a lot of good, honest people in the world. Mm. There are people in the world that pray to the Father in relationship to things that are germane to humankind and themselves Mm -hmm. and their situations and their problems. They're not praying to Jesus Christ. They're praying to the Father. Mm. I wake up every morning and I ask the Father to do da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da, yada-yada-yada. Mm-hmm. I go to bed at night before I go. I thank the Father for bringing me through the day and giving me the strength to be able to do the things that I do. They're praying to the Father, just like J.C. told them to. Mm. That's right. That's right. And you and I, you and I are sitting at these mics and we are talking to some good people. Sure. Absolutely. 
and much and much not like the bully across the street, we are not sentencing anybody to anything or anywhere because that's not our call. That's right. That's right. Yeah. Just because you don't believe what we're saying to you, I'm not going to tell you that you're going to you're you're you're, you're going to you, you, number one, number one, there's no hell in tax. Yeah, that that that's quintessential and key to understand that that and, aspect, period. And the second part of it is that in Ezekiel, the most high writes and he says, I get no pleasure in the destruction of the wicked. So that means that he doesn't have anything planned for the wicked that's going to bring about any eternal damnation or destruction. Yeah. Agreed. That doesn't mean, however, that as you live and breathe and you walk in your wickedness and you treat his people wrong, that don't mean he ain't going to destroy you because he will. And he's proven that he has in the past yeah. and he will. And he's continuing to do it today, even if you don't recognize it. Exactly. You can check the receipts on that one right in text. Right. That's that's riddled all over the place. You can find a whole heck of a lot of that in, in the book that we continue to keep talking about, which is Shelf Team. But now then, the issue is not, the issue is around the, the, the lifespan of the soul. Mm. And the greatest fear that our people have, because it's been ingrained in their mind from Eurocentric theologians and put in their mind, is that if you don't Give your life to Jesus Christ. You are going to hell. That's doggy doo doo. Yeah, that. That's doggy doo doo. I, I always want to. I always want to get. I want to get on my soapbox every single time you bring that issue up. I want to get on my soapbox every single time because I can't say it enough. Because once I had the revelation about it, I said, "My goodness, it's something that." It's the fear and the trepidation that's been put into people and instilled in us about a place that really does not exist at all. It's, it's a construct of Greek mythology that has been inserted into the New Testament to get you as a motivator, to get you to turn. Because otherwise, you'd be like, well, what, what motivation do I have to follow this dude? Exactly. Because uh, if I don't have hell, if I remove hell from this scenario, then what is your reasoning for following this cat? Because I just want to get into heaven? Okay. What is that construct about? You, you're you reading text that basically defines, and you we've done this in previous podcasts before, But so I don't know where people are tuning in at, so I'm just going to say it again. I'm beating around the bush. I want to say it. So I'm going to say it. Hell does not exist. It is a construct. If the Most High, if hell was such a pivotal place then how come he didn't make it in the first six days? It's never mentioned in the first six days. And then I go ahead and I have to address the, again the smarty pants is in the room that want to say, well, there was no need for him to make it because sin hasn't entered the world yet or, or the fall of man hasn't entered the world yet. Okay, let's go with that one. Okay, it happened. And as we're passing out butt whoopings around the table, and let's get something straight, getting back on my issue again about being headship. He didn't come after the woman and say first and say, you screwed up. I gave that commandment to you, man. So I'm holding you responsible. I'm going to pass out this whoop butt whooping to you first. So we're going to go around the table. This person gets this. This person gets that. The beast or the serpent gets cursed to the ground. That's not the devil. Read the text. It has nothing to do with the devil. That is a serpent. Furthermore. If that was the case, and I'm passing all this out, then why don't we mention hell there? That I'm going to send to all these people to this particular place because now that the fall of man has happened, i got to send these people that have jacked up to a, to a specific part of the room where the dunce cap people are going to sit. That is not expressed anywhere. So where do we get these concepts? Oh, well, brother, what does it say about Sheol? Sheol is the place that's mentioned in numerous places in your text. Great. I'm glad that you mentioned that. And so is Hades. That's, Sheol, if you do your research on it, has nothing to do with hell. Sheol is the grave. That's the Hebrew word for grave. So when it talks it's about... It's the my, holding place of the soul. When it says in going down to 
uh, my anger burns all the way down to Sheol. That's not some place where the demons and the imps and all this other stuff come from. That's not that place. You're interjecting things in there to drive people into a religion by fear. Bully. And that is not the way to do it. When the Most High introduced himself to our ancestors, it wasn't somebody could come back and say, well, he went up on a mountain and his introduction, he had bolts of lightning and thunder and all that type of stuff. And he made an entrance, but he introduced himself by showing himself to our ancestors by the way that he delivered. Exactly. It wasn't, I'm coming in here kicking the door down. No. You he, didn't, <laughs> he didn't destroy him. And listen, all that was, was for the most high to express his authority. And to prove to Israel, to prove to them mm-hmm. his signature statement. And now you know that I am Yahweh. Exactly. So and 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 now that you know I am Yahweh, you know also I'm not a spirit that you can mess with. Exactly. Exactly. Therefore, the authority let me tell you something. When you was a baby, your daddy or mama scared the bejesus out of you when they brought that belt out. That's right. That's right. And you learned how to act and you learned how to respect them. Because you knew that if you didn't, you was going to get another butt whooping. The Most High came out on Mount on Mount Sinai and established his authority amongst the nation to say, I am not any spirit that you want to mess with. Right. And you've seen what I can do because I did exactly what I said I was going to do to Mitzrayim. I mean, gee, man, guys. I mean, it's, it's, I'm showing you the fruit of, I'm, if you follow me, and you are want to acquiesce to being a part, to be my wife, then I've showed you exactly what I'm about. It's nothing that you need to fear. So why in the world would you allow somebody to come in and tell you that if you don't do X, your eternal soul is damned to a place of burning sulfur and so on and so on and so forth and so forth. There's no basis for that. The Most High doesn't even operate like that. No. So that's that's preying on people's ability to be naive and not getting an understanding. Matter of fact, there's somebody on YouTube, some people, some people might understand this, so I'm going to break this out. But our idea with all this is to get an outstanding understanding so our stance on misunderstandings can be completely understood. I'm going to say that one more time. We are supposed to get an outstanding understanding so our stance on misunderstandings over there across the street can be understood. That's what we're purposing to do is shed light. So we're able to get an understanding, which if that talks about in Proverbs chapter four, verse seven is the order in order to seek wisdom. You need to get it first and all thy getting, get an understanding. You know, so I come back to, to, to what I, to my definition. There are people in this world who are good people Mm -hmm. who treat all humanity with respect. Oh yeah. They don't know anything. There are people who don't know anything about church, but they know about the father, which is good. That's a good spot. It's a good place. And that's the reason why he talks about the fact that not only am I going to bring Israel back from all the places that I have dispersed her. Mm -hmm. But I am also going to bring those of the nations. Mm -hmm. People of the nations who are good people are going to be brought into the messianic era or the millennial age. And the nations say, the text says, and the nations say, let us go up to Jerusalem for the Torah is being taught. It's being taught there Mm -hmm. so that they can learn so that they can live out their life in the millennial age and be accepted into the eighth day, the final destination, which is called eternal life. Mm -hmm. Now, the elephant in the room that has captured our people, once again, getting back to what we just talked about, is the fact that 
I've been taught that if I don't accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, I'm going to go to hell. Mm. So I go to church, and I've gravitated to this Eurocentric idea to protect my soul from hell. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And that's all you're going to hear. If you listen to my mother, my mother says, I just want to make it. What make? Make what? Yeah. What's, well, what's well, the heaven, opposite? Yeah. What's the opposite of not making it? I don't want to go to hell. Right. Brother, you're not going to hell. Yeah, you don't no, need to worry about there's, that. There's no, there's no place. There's no place in the foundation of scripture where the most high ever talks about anybody going to hell. He did not create a hell. Right. That's right. You're either alive and well, or you don't exist. Yeah, now think about that. You don't exist at all. Now, that's, now mm. there's, an interesting, there's an interesting factor to the last part, not exist. Because the idea of non existing does not have a pain factor involved in it. It's true. Hell and an inferno has a pain factor, mm-hmm. which is which which is the deterrent factor that causes me and pushes me to accept Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Because if I don't accept him, I'm going to have pain, eternal pain. I'm going to be on fire, eternal fire. The Most High says, no, I will cut you off Mm -hmm. from the nation of Israel. Cut off means you don't exist. Can I ask you a question real quick? Sure. Let's examine that for a second. Just please correct me if I'm wrong because you have wisdom. If you, because I like the way you eloquently said, oh, in this issue of John on the Isle of Isle of Patmos and the heaven is going to be manifested in the earth and yada, yada, yada. This issue of hell. If you die and your body returns to the dust, then what is being experiencing pain? What is burning? Yeah, I'm thinking about that for a second, because am I looking at that wrong? No. Because if a person is sitting there saying, because you're looking at a standpoint and say, I don't want to burn. I don't want to I don't want to be having things eating and maggots eating at my flesh and all this stuff. But you decompose and your body returns to the dust. So what is actually if you analyze it, what is burning in the eternal lake of sulfur and fire? Ooh, you know what? You know, what, what? is that? You know what? You know what? You know what? Um. We, we think, we think off the chart. We think off the chart. That's, 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 where'd that come from? That's off the chart. Because the soul of man has... No feeling in the grave. It's it's dormant. Right. It's like it's like it's like going Oh Father, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It's like being anesthetized. When you go into surgery mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and they put you under Right. You lose all consciousness of everything that ever existed anywhere until you wake up. Until you wake up. You go, yeah, exactly. Not cognizant of anything. So the soul, the soul, I want you all to hear this. Now, now, now you say, well, where's the scripture for that? <laughs> well, gee, well, let's appeal to logic. Okay. Let's. Man is the construct of body, soul, and spirit. Your Greek text gives us that. But it didn't need to because our text exemplifies it. Mm -hmm. 
The body decays, it goes to dust. When the body decays and goes to dust, it has no, once, once, once the spirit of the Most High leaves the body, mm-hmm. the body has no further regulation, recule, recollection or consciousness of anything that existed before that happened. Mm-hmm. Because life now and spirit have gone out of the body. The body goes to dust. The only thing that remains is the soul. Mm-hmm. The soul, y'all told me in your document over there, y'all told me in your document that the soul of man was asleep in the grave. Yes. That's the reason why when my sister died mm-hmm. and at the funeral, right. the, the pastor there <laughs> didn't want to agree with me when I told them mm-hmm. as they were trying to put her in heaven, sitting at the piano, playing for the heavenly choir. And I told him, my sister is not sitting at a piano mm-hmm. playing for anybody. Right. My sister's soul is asleep. S- asleep. As if to say, my sister's soul is anesthetized. Mm. It's asleep, awaiting, mm-hmm. awaiting its Revivation from the dust. Mm -hmm. She's not in heaven looking down. None of that. Right. So, so the idea that the Eurocentrics with their Greek mythology have injected into a narrative as one gentleman told me last week after I posted, you're going to hell. <laughs> oh, he really, dude. Yeah, come on now. <clears throat> really, dude. <laughs> Is the idea that the soul is like a computer hard drive. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Everything that we've done in life is recorded on the hard drive of the soul. Every experience is recorded on the hard drive of the soul. Mm -hmm. The body dies. The spirit goes back to the most high. The hard drive then goes to sleep. Mm -hmm. It needs, in order for it to function or have any sense of feeling, Mm -hmm. again, it has to be connected to a body and a spirit so it can repopulate. Right. Like the hard drive of a computer, you can you can take out the motherboard, you can put in a whole new motherboard, you can take an old hard drive that's been laying dormant, connect it to the threads that, that to the to the to the motherboard, turn that thing on, plug plug it into the wall where it gets spirit, which right. is juice, to cause it to populate, turn it on, the hard drive populates, and everything that was on that par- on that hard drive is now visible functioning and, and, and you have the ability to see what's there. That's right. That's the soul. Mm. Mm. That's the soul. Mm. What scripture do you have to prove that? <laughs> Appeal to logic. Yeah. I've already given you the scenario. Mm-hmm. Body, dust, spirit goes back to the most high. That's right. The soul is, 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 is retrieved and held in Limbo or Sheol, mm-hmm. the holding place of right. the of the of the demise of the soul, mm-hmm. and it's it's asleep. So what's burning? So what's burning? What are you feeling? You're not feeling anything. anything. <laughs> Your soul's not feeling anything. It's asleep. It goes to sleep. And matter of fact, the the, the, the interesting part is that. It's anesthetized. Yeah, it's, it has no feeling. Matter of fact, and it's not going to have any feeling until you look. You looking for a text? I'm gonna give it to him too. I want, I'm, isn't it over there in First Thessalonians somewhere over like four and fifteen well, somewhere you, there? You go get that one. I'm going to Daniel. Okay. I'm, I'm go going to Dan. Go I'm to going to Daniel. Where's that text at? I'm going to Daniel. The, the good prophet. Daniel chapter 12. Mm-hmm. 
Now, anytime you hear in Scripture when it says when that time comes, okay, Mm -hmm. when that time comes, when that time comes is a reference to the day of redemption, when Israel is redeemed out of the out of exile and brought back to the land. It's prophetic when mm-hmm. that when that time comes. There's a time coming. Anytime you see those words in text, that's what it's talking to. Mm-hmm. Michael, the great prince who champions your people, that's Israel, will stand up. And there will be a time of distress unparalleled between the time they became a nation and that moment. So now we haven't entered into when that time comes yet. At that time, many people will be delivered. Everyone whose name is written in the book. In the book. Many of those sleeping, sleeping, many of those sleeping, sleeping, sleeping Sleeping? in the dust of the earth will awaken. Many of those sleeping in the dust of the earth will Will? awaken. Mm -hmm. Now. So. Let's 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 put this in, 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 in perspective. The body's gone back to dust. The spirit's gone back to the most high. Mm -hmm. So many sleeping in the dust of the earth will awaken. So this awakening from the dust means what? Mm. What does it mean? It means that your soul is going to be reconnected to the source that gives it what gives it the ability to have animation and it's going to be wrapped again in a body mm-hmm. because he's saying it. Many of those sleeping in the dust will, of the earth will awaken some to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame and abhorrence. Mm. What are you talking about? Powerful. He's talking about there's going to be judgment. That's right. I'm going to judge you. And it's not going to be before the the great white throne of judgment. Right. Okay. I'm going to judge you. I'm yeah. going to judge I'm going to judge those that are sleeping. Mhm. But those who can discern will shine like the brightness of Shemaim's dome, heaven's dome, mm. and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and forever. That's you and me. There you go. There you go. That's what we're doing. Right. And you know what? what's interesting? Like I said, that that's beautiful, what you read over there. Because it's, I almost don't want to read it, but it's in, I found it over here on their side of the street too, that says something very similar, but it's clouded with a whole bunch of Greek-ism over there. I almost hate to read it. But if you go to First Thessalonica, or the folks in Thessalonica, First Thessalonians, Chapter 4, and you go to 16, it says, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with an arising cry and will call from one of the ruling angels, and with God so far, those who have died united with the Messiah will be first to rise. That means you were in the ground somewhere. And then there will be caught up in all this other stuff, and that's where they get their well, whole entire rapture thing. But you thing, see, the point, being, the point Yeah, the point is. The point is, the, the historical text, the scriptorial text, the Hebrew text, doesn't talk about anybody being first to rise. Mm-hmm. It simply says, many of those sleeping in the dust of the earth will awaken some to everlasting life and some to everlasting shame, shame. and abhorrence. Mm-hmm. That shame and abhorrence means that you're going to get dismissed. Mm. <laughs> right off the bat. But those who can discern, mm-hmm. discern what? What does the word discern mean? Yeah, those to, who to can understand. It. Yeah. Will shine like the brightness of heaven's dome. Mm. Mm. And those who turn many to righteousness, like 
the stars forever and ever. For those who do what? That turn those to, what does it say? But those who can discern will shine like the brightness of heaven's dome. And those who turn many. Those who turn many. To righteousness. To righteousness. Now, now we're talking about, now we're talking about the first aspect of righteousness. Mm. Those that turn many to Torah. That's right. That's that right. righteousness. Mm-hmm will shine like the stars forever and ever. I'm glad you made the distinction. Yeah. What righteousness? Torah. Torah. That is what we're talking about. Torah. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing. But those are, those are the kinds of things that I'm glad that we bring these things up in the podcast for yeah, people I mean, to understand that you've been given this, this culture, co- these colloquialisms, this, these, these things that overshadow you and keep you in what you like to call us being in bondage, but how in the world do you, can you say that when you just analytically look at what you're reading and it doesn't make any sense? It doesn't line up with anything. Now, now, let, let, let's, let, let, let me close this with this, with this, with this caption. Sure. So the question is, well, sure. what is the benefit of me uh, uh, walking in Torah now, what's the what's what's what benefit do, do what's what's the purpose? Why why is this beneficial to me? Well, it's a simple thing to to to, to understand, and that is one of the reasons why it's significant and important now to do this is because there are certain benefits that are available to the man or the woman, either Hebrew or from the nations, gravitating to Torah. Mm-hmm. You say, well, what are those? Well, what are those? It places the Most High in an obligatory st- state where He is obligated to be your covering mm. and to be your protector. Right. And to provide, to provide to you the kinds of things that are necessary for life in this world. So he says to us, um, in oh, let me see, where is it? I'm trying to find it here. Uh, where is it? He says it says to us. Let me see. Uh, Can't find it. Mm. Um, it's in D- it's in Devarim. He says, "By following my words and my instructions." Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Ooh, hold you, on. I'm you go just somewhere. by that part, you just you quoting the whole entire book of Devarim. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna go somewhere. I need I need to go somewhere. 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 Be there for me. Be there for me. What are, you, what are you trying to find? I'm trying to find my mitzvotes. Oh, the ones that... Uh... There it is right there. Oh, okay. Oh, that's, that's 14. Like y'all can see what we're looking at. That's 14. <laughs> that's 14. I need 15. I didn't put 15 out. Uh, one of the uh, mitzvot that he tells us is that it's vital for us as a people... By, by, get out of there. Done with you. In which that we follow, that by following his ways and his mitzvot, he tells tells us that things will go well for you. Yeah. Oh and, yeah. Wow. You know, That's and the idea and the idea of things going well for you is is to say, well, I, I'm doing I'm doing okay. Well, you may be doing okay. And you may be you may you may consider that as being well, mm-hmm. but you don't know well things going well with you within the framework of the ability of the Most High to cause things to go well for you. I mean, it's like it's like mm, it's like being satisfied with. 
It's like a poor man being satisfied with $1,000 and missing out on the fact that he can have a billion. Right. Right. And that's my, and that's my point. And it's in Deuteronomy. Um, oh, chapter four somewhere, maybe? I didn't post it in my, it's not, it's, no, it's, it, no, it's not in four. It's in, it's down below that. It's in, it's in, I, it's, it's below 10. You know what? I would have to say just open in the book of Devarim, period, because the, uh, uh, Moshe says that a lot about following the mitzvot and doing this. So when you matriculate into the land, things will go well with you, that the land won't spew you out. But 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 here's the point. Here's the point. Mm-hmm. It's not just in the land that things will go well for you. Mm-hmm. It's in this exile because he says, by following my rules and my instructions, things will go well for you anywhere you live on earth. Mm. Now, Agreed, yeah. It's good. Just because you have money doesn't mean things are going well for you. No, oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Your health could be screwed up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Your family can be in turmoil. Mm-hmm. There are a lot of things that can go wrong, so wealth does not define things going well for you. Mm. Then he says, in Psalms, he says, if your ways please me, I will give you the desires of your heart. Now, the optimal word in the text is ways. Mm. People don't know that ways is speaking about Torah. Right. 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 I will give you the desires of your heart. So a person can say, well, I've got everything I ever wanted. Mm-hmm. Do you? Mm. Do you? Interesting. Do you really? Have you really stopped and thought about that? Mm. Um, do you have do you have peace of mind? Mm. Do you worry? Mm. Are, are there any concerns that you have that you don't have any control over? Or mm. the most high can, can handle the things you and I don't have control over. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. So this idea of following Torah in this exile is prevalent to the idea that the Most High will be your covering. He will protect you from your enemies and those who hate you. Mm. I'm going to step out on a. I'm going to step oh, out on. A, I'm going to step yeah, out I'm, on a limb, and this limb that I'm going to step on, step out on, is very strong. I'm not stepping out on on a limb on that's subject week. to break. Okay. What you got? If our people would stop worshiping idolatry and turn back to the Most High, you would never have to fear your enemy, even in this exile. That's 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 a that's strong. That's you stepping out on. Steel. And the reason why no I branch. say that because once you oh man. <laughs> Once you realize who you are yeah. and who your protector is, you come under the covering of that protector. And guess what? His word is firm when you are Israel because he says his eyes are always upon you. That's correct. And not only that, he says, I have, I have, I have written your name in the palm of my hand. Yeah. It's, it's very cathartic what you just said. It's very... Think about, so, yeah. so, if, so if I lived in the South mm-hmm. where all this mayhem and all this belief stuff is going on, I wouldn't fear. Yeah, there's nothing to, yeah, because you have the most high. Because I've got the most high. And I know that the most high have some Malachim that are assigned to me, and I can call on them. As a matter of fact, they sitting up there, I wish, I wish we had some work to do. <laughs> We're waiting for our for somebody to call us at at Trippy Hesh to help you, but nobody's calling us because y- y'all don't believe in us. Mm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But if an angel, if a Malachim showed up in front of Balak and the donkey saw him, that's right, <laughs> that's right. And the donkey had enough nerve to talk back had to him sense. and say, "Listen, hey, listen now." Yeah, yeah. So I mean. I don't live my life in fear 
of anybody who puts their pants on the same I do because I walk under the covering of the Most High. I follow his rules and his instructions. I only worship him, Mm -hmm. and that obligates him as being my husband to be my protector. Yeah. That's a wealth that cannot be measured. That's the reason why I walk in the mitzvot, the commandments, the laws and rules of the Most High in this exile. That's only one reason. Mm. That's only one reason. Yeah, because we might have to do this over like a thousand podcasts if you to enumerate all the of them. The main reason, <laughs> the main reason I do them is because he is my husband. I love my husband. So therefore, I want to be obedient to my husband, which gets back to where we <laughs> opened up we started. the idea of trust. That's right. I trust him because he has proven himself worthy of trust. Over and, and over, over and, and over, over again. again. Well, this has been Rabbi Robert B. Holman Jr. and Sean Appleton. And this has been Hebrews, Hebrews in, in Exile. exile. Shalom. Shalom.